Did you know that in the US there are more than 4.5 million private businesses that are looking to sell within the next 10 to 15 years? Just that number alone is staggering. And a lot of them will succeed, but more than that will not. And here to help those business owners, if you are one of them, listen in, here to help you sell your business for more and better are the co-founders of Exit IQ, Rick and Corey Tanner. And Exit IQ is gonna really help us change things for these business owners, gentlemen, welcome. And we can't wait to start quizzing you on how you're gonna do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. So tell us about the state of business today, the private companies and their owners. I think everyone goes into business expecting to be able to exit big and sell with success. But we see that 90, sorry, 70% or more actually don't successfully close. And these numbers have really shocked me. I mean, I know Amy's a private business owner. I'm a small business owner. And I just I just want to know what what I need to do. What, how do I need to start thinking in order to actually exit my business successfully? Well, it, the statistics are staggering. I mean, they really are. You think about 4.5 million businesses across the US will change hands in the next 10 to 15 years. What's incredible about that statistic is that the market cap of those companies is $10 trillion. That has a tremendous impact on the US economy. I mean, you think about that. Recent studies indicate that 88% of those business owners do not have a written exit plan. And as you've indicated, 70% of the businesses that are for sale never close. So that means the majority of those business owners are not are either not going to leave their business when they want to and how they want to some won't be able to retire at all most investment bankers are not really interested in representing companies unless they are in the five to ten million dollar range mm -hmm. of market value mm -hmm. and so prior to that normally we have to go and de uh, develop a relationship obviously with a business broker but the number of interested parties greatly shrink for that size of business. Mm -hmm. So obviously what we're trying to accomplish is to coach those businesses until they get to that five to $10 million range so that we can open up the entire national network of investment bankers that we work with. Rick, Corey, you see this every day. What are the, what are the top issues that business owners are facing? And, you know, it, with, with odds like that, that 70% don't close, are we better off to just, you know, tie up our funds in more typical investments and, and not put all of our money into our businesses? And we can run our businesses at whatever minimal level they run. And maybe we should be investing in 401ks or other investment tools instead of consistently trying to grow our business for a bigger exit. That's true, Lauren. One of the, when we talk about 70% of businesses that don't close uh, and talking how staggering that is, the reason for that is that a lot of businesses struggle with, um, with really three things. Um, the business owner, first of all, has a very unrealistic value on the business. Um, we see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And the reason they usually have an unrealistic value is because they put sweat equity into the business. And they want a value for that, even though sometimes that doesn't show up on your balance sheet. Um, and so the second thing also is they choose the wrong investment banker or an inexperienced advisor. Um, that's where we're trying to, to bridge that gap. Uh, when, we, when you have a really inexperienced um, advisor or investment banker, it causes a problem when you go to market because there's, not, there's nobody that understands your business the way that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give an example. Several years ago, we, we began a relationship with an owner of a large landscaping company, and she tried to sell her business prior to working with us. Mm -hmm. And she said that the investment banker that she worked with just didn't understand her business. Um, there were very few things that he could, he could intricately explain to, to potential buyers. And by default, what resulted in that is the communication broke down between her and potential buyers. And after six months, she backed out of the deal. And so when she came to work with us, we started the process all over. We sat down, we understood her business intricately. 
And when we went to find the best investment banker for her, we knew what investment banker was going to be best for her. So what we do is we go to the national network and we find the top three investment bankers for her and all three would be great choices. From then, what she needs to decide is which one is she going to be willing to deal with for six to 12 or even 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that if you get somebody who doesn't match your personality, it's going to be a long right. time. Yeah. Um, and so we want that to match as well. And so by increasing her exit IQ and taking time to really understand her business, we ended up selling two divisions of the company to outside buyers and the rest of her internal management group for more money than if she had sold it to a single company. And wow. So it worked out in the end and she's extremely happy with the result. Wow. That is really amazing. But I understand what you're saying about that first part where like you, you put so much time. So I've like, you know, been a business owner for about 12 years now and I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud that we made it. We bootstrapped it. We, you know, we got all the clients ourselves and then you're going to tell me my baby is ugly and it's only worth $5. <laughs> so I totally get that, but you have to be realistic and be like, you know what? My, my baby's kind of ugly. I mean, you're just going to have to face it, you know? So getting that reality check with an advisor, I think is really helpful. Well, and what's really interesting about, uh, about the relationship between a business owner and his business is it, it is extremely emotional to go through the process, obviously, of selling that business. It's not just the financial things that you worry about. It's all the other emotional struggles that he also is going to face and go through over the next six to 18 months. What are some of those emotional struggles that, that you most commonly run up against? Just, just think about uh, the first thing is just letting go. Yeah. Right? Just coming to grips with the fact that I am no longer going to be coming to the office every single day and engaging my energies and my intelligence and everything that I have going into that business. It's mm -hmm. all going to go away. Mm -hmm. The other emotional thing that we always get into is the fact that he doesn't know what he's going to do typically after the sale of the business. Mm. So it's their lifestyle changes that they're worrying about. It's mm -hmm. that emotional struggle of, do I really want to go home to my wife and have nothing to do for the next you know, 20 years? And does she want me to come and home then, and have that? You here? know what, that's so funny because I have a friend who sold his business and he was just like home all the time. And finally his wife was like, I married you for breakfast and dinner, but not lunch. Go oh, find exactly something right. to do. Well, I've done that <laughs> with my own wife just during COVID. So I, you know, I know what you're talking about. So yeah, totally. Emotional things. And then the other thing that you have to consider, obviously, is a lot of times you're leaving key employees, yeah. and also family members behind, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to be employed by the new owner. And so mm -hmm. there's a struggle about how much do I want to protect them? Is there stay bonuses? Is there contracts? Are there things yeah. that I want to do on a compensation basis to make sure that they're taken care of from a long-term perspective. That makes a lot of sense. Do you, find, do you find that owners stay on in order to complete a transition? Is that something you guys recommend to get involved with? They do, yeah. Most, most buyers want owners to stay on for a period of time. They want them to be able to transition a new, a, either a new CEO or a new person who's gonna run the business and they need time for that transition to happen. And so they'll usually sign a stay contract that will include a salary or something for a number of years. Um, some, sometimes we see it as little as 12 months all the way up to 36 or 48 months. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really just depends on the, on, the, on the buyer. And that's something that we can negotiate um, in the close is how long you stay. Because as we run into certain emotional things, one of the things you're gonna run into as well is I'm a business owner. I don't enjoy working for somebody else and being on their clock. And so all and of a that's sudden, why I asked. that's right. Yeah. yeah, that is, re that is really interesting. Huh. What are some of the other key pieces that our viewers and of course, Amy need to know in order to really, you know, what are we missing? What are, what are some of the other hot buttons? Well, one of the things that you brought up earlier, Lauren, was the fact that a lot of business owners invest such a large amount of their net worth into their businesses. And maybe they should diversify some of those financial resources outside. Mm. It's very common for most entrepreneurs, particularly if they have a single business to invest 
eight or eighty or ninety percent of their their net worth into their business, mm -hmm. and it makes sense because that's where they feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's also where they get the highest rate of return on their investment if they build a successful business. I've heard so many entrepreneurs say, "I'd rather invest in myself than anyone else." For sure, right? Because that's where their confidence level is. Right. And they have confidence in both their own abilities and they work side by side with employees mm -hmm. that also drive significant profits. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. This is pretty exciting for us because they're great friends of ours. But a number of years ago, uh, we were approached with a, a gentleman who had a, a paving company mm -hmm. and his dad had started the business and he wanted to pass the business now on to his son. And so this would be a three generation owned uh, paving firm. And what was interesting about that is early on in the process, I, I asked him, how does your son feel about taking over the business? And his reply actually shocked me. He said, well, we really haven't talked about it much. And I said, oh. you gotta be kidding me. He said, look, my son's worked in this business since he was 13 years old. I'm sure he's gonna wanna take over this business. So I encouraged him to go have that serious conversation with his son before we go any further. Well, he flew over to San Diego where his son was finishing up his MBA and had that conversation. And the next week when he came back into the office, I asked him, well, how did your conversation go? <laughs> he said, my son asked me one question. I said, really, uh, what was that? He says, dad, how much is the business worth? He said, I told him that the business was worth about $50 million. And he said, dad, what business couldn't we buy together that we could manage and really like? I hate the paving business. <laughs> <laughs> Just blew him away, blew me away. Obviously, sometimes the optimal uh, investment strategy or exit strategy is not always uh, the best long term if you don't really dig in in the, uh, in the setting objective stage. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we, we backed up, we went from an internal transfer, remarketed his business as an outside sale. We ended up closing the business uh, for 80, over $80 million just nine months later because we identified the value drivers of that business and were able to increase those and find out the mo motivation of the buyer so that, that we could close at the highest possible price. Those guys are great friends uh, with us today. They coach us on our golf game and we continue to co coach them on their, on their business activities. I think our coaching, Corey, is actually it's, going better than better. theirs. Yeah. <laughs> if I were them, I would be sending you flowers every week. Oh my gosh. No, my really, like what a win-win to be able to like, you know, the, the more that, the more that you coach them, the more they win. So that's a, that's an amazing that's strategy. Right. Yeah, well, I, I've learned so much already um, through this process. Um, where have you seen companies fail? That's a great question because we see it all the time. This is probably our biggest pet peeve is when a company gets contacted. I mean, put yourself in the position of a buyer. Mm -hmm. Best situation you can be in is I'm going to go to a company before they market it for sale because I'm interested in it, I'm just gonna give them an offer and see if they take it. I know all the internal stuff about their business and I can give them an offer that purely benefits me and they don't know any better because they don't think anybody is interested because they're the only buyer and so they end up selling it. Mm -hmm. We do this all the time. And they've spent sometimes five, 10, 20 years to build a business that they end up selling at a discount because they don't have multiple buyers in, at, at the table resulting in a low leverage situation. Their exit IQ is very low. Mm. And so this is the biggest problem that we run into is when your exit IQ is low, it, it gives a buyer the opportunity to take advantage of you in a number of ways. Um, mm. Most large firms have very big acquisition teams that strategically come for you. Um, mm. They come and they negotiate so that it benefits them long-term. Mm -hmm. And we want the negotiation to be made from the seller's um, shoes. We want them to have the leverage for as long as possible, all the way down into the close, so that they can decide what's best for them, what's best for their employees, and best for their business. Where can they find more information? Where that is a great question. How do we contact you? Right? 
So where can they find your clients you and learn more? 100%. The best place to go is our website um, at exitiq.com. Um, on that website, you can join our, our newsletter, our e-newsletter that goes out every four to six weeks called The Exit Coach. And in that newsletter, we pretty much give you the industry's best you know, strategies and advice of how to better prepare yourself for sale. And so the best place to go is to exitiq.com and just contact us from there. Or you can just call us for initial consultation. <laughs> We're happy okay, to do I'm that as well. The number is on the website. It is. Yeah. All right, I just I just submitted my form. She's Hi, there now. You guys. <laughs> All right, Amy. Gentlemen, thank you for, you for you. joining us. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Pleasure. We'll see Pleasure. You again.